Welcome back, everybody, to the Life Choices Podcast, where we discuss mindset, success, the good and the tough aspects of going after your passions. Today, we have Russell Stevens, a.k.a. DJ Merkham. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, man. I've been pretty stoked about this. Uh, you and I have known each other for quite some time, and we met through uh, my good friend, TJ Bella, as well as your good friend. And we've had this really interesting relationship since then where we've kind of come in and out of each other's lives. And we have the same mindset on a lot of topics. And I love how you and I, whenever we do converse, whether it's here at the compound or if we're in a bar, it really doesn't matter where. We just we just get into this conversation where, like, the rest of the world kind of, like, floats away. And I've been super keen to have you on here as a guest. So if you could do us a favor right now and just tell our uh, viewers and listeners out there a little bit about uh, about you, about your background and, and where you're at right now. Oh, man, where do I begin? Um, you know, it, it's been a great journey so far, and uh, I'm really thankful for who I've become and, and my life path. And as you said, you know, we've always chopped it up and had some good combos and stuff like that. And you know, there's definitely a synergy when we speak and, you know, it's a, it's a two part conversation always. And I really enjoy like talking to people like you because like, I feel like, like I'm heard and like, I, I can take something out of the conversation when I leave it. So it's pretty dope. You know, I'm, uh, I'm from South Florida. Um, I've lived in uh, South Florida most of my life, but the past four years I've been living out in Breckenridge, Colorado, kind of switched it up all together. And I couldn't be more happier, man. It's fun. You know, I've um, been doing creative arts for the past two decades and uh, been having a good time doing it. You know, money's good and great memories involved too. get to meet a lot of cool people and do something that I like to do that, that provides happiness. You know, I'm not doing some mundane job that I don't like and, you know, makes people's lives like miserable, you know, like, uh, you know, doing parties and stuff like that and throwing down a good set is just like, it's very heartwarming, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're literally bringing happiness and that type of wealth into people's lives. And for the most part, into people's lives that don't even know you. Because mm -hmm. they may be at, um, at an event or they might be in the town that you're in for a weekend and they happen to come by a place that you're spinning. And boom, you get to kind of add a little, sprinkle a little love into their life almost. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, like growing up, I was definitely somewhat of an introvert. So, you know, approaching people was definitely not my steez. And, uh, you know, being being the, the center of the attention at a party, per se, is is kind of like a way of, of breaking the ice already. You know, I can I can talk to people through my hands, you know, and just spinning music and not have to really approach them. And, you know, nine out of 10 times they end up approaching me. And, you know, it's, it, it takes out half the legwork right there alone. I love, I love it. Um, I'm going to parallel that similarity with what I do for a living uh, as a chef is everyone knows that if you're at a house or on a boat or what have you, people tend to gravitate to the kitchen, to the galley. So I don't, I, I'm the same way. Growing up, I, I don't want to say I was shy, but I definitely wasn't the social butterfly that I am now. And cooking just allowed me to stay in one spot and everyone just kind of came into that area while you're working and they, they start the conversation it just Absolutely. makes it easy nah food is a good way to connect people you know like uh sitting around the dinner table with your friends or family is is a great way to like talk about your day and like talk about life and just what's going on with you and stuff like that and you know food is something that you need you know so like you know, when you throw down a good meal and you, you really put like your energy and your passion into it, it's a good way to connect to people, you know, like it, it definitely like transfer transfers over to your behaviors and your thoughts and stuff like that. Like, I'm definitely a firm believer of like, if you if you eat crappy food, you know, you're going to feel crappy, <laughs> Facts. you know, so it, it's always cool when you get somebody that knows what they're doing in the kitchen and, uh, you know, you come together and you have like a great meal and great conversation. And conversely on that, I'll, I'll say the same thing to what you do. I mean, what is life without music? Yeah, man, it's a good way to, you know, to speak with people, even if you guys like talk a different language. Mm -hmm. You know, music is definitely universal. It's a vibration that that like everybody understands. Absolutely. Uh, just before we started filming, actually, you and I were just briefly talking about age and whatnot. 
And, uh, you know, my viewers, our viewers always know that I'm 45 years young and you're saying you're coming up on 41, 41, right? I mean, I don't think either one of us, I mean, we don't look 19, but I don't think we look like we're in our forties. No, definitely not. Um, been a long journey for both of us to get us to where we are now. What was, what was it like? I'm talking way back when early stages, I'm talking like grade school type stuff for you, man. I mean, grade school was, was fun. You know, like I was very academic, um, you know, I was very book smart and stuff like that. And, uh, read a lot of books and stuff. And, um, you know, I was kind of, uh, you know, middle class growing up. So my parents couldn't afford to like take me out for pizza and stuff like that. So I always remember like, um, reading books for like pizzas like every time you like finished a book you'd get like a, a coupon for a personal pan pizza at pizza hut or something like that so i was i was very studious and like loved reading and stuff like that um i loved being outside i wasn't really much of a video gamer or anything like that like um i was definitely into like skateboarding surfing bmx and stuff like that and going to kick it with my friends so i would i would ride my bike cross county to go have fun, you know, and just be outside, you know? Yeah. Which is very different today. These kids today, man, they're just like glued to a device and, you know, it's, it's definitely affecting their social skills and everything in between. I mean, it, it, it can be used for good. It can be used for bad. I agree with you. Uh, as a child, I think the era that we grew up in, our parents pretty much made us go outside. You know, they didn't want us in the house playing <laughs> around anymore. We were probably getting on their nerves. But, you know, my brothers and I, we'd, we'd um, I'm, you know, I'm from Canada. So in the cold weather, we'd grab our hockey sticks and we'd just play ball hockey on the road. And even my dad would come out and play with us. I mean, it was, it was brilliant. But, yeah, nowadays, you know, you have that, that gaming community which all all the power to you i mean these people are, are making livings out of doing video gaming but you're losing that that outdoor adventure that i think we had as as kids when when you were developing all your skills and i love the fact i mean i can tell that you you read when you were younger just because of the way you you speak when when did you start living the lifestyle of the mindset that you have now you know, I would say like in my mid 20s, um, you know, going going into high school, I uh, definitely got into the crowd of, you know, smoking weed and skipping school and, you know, just being uh, being a hood rat, I would say. <laughs> and, um, you know, in my 20s, I had a, uh, um, you know, a, a career at the time, I guess I would call it of carpentry and I did glass and mirror. And um, I had a lot of fun doing that, especially being out in the in the installation field and being able to like see different homes all through South Florida and not be like in a shop or an office or something like that. And um, I did that for a while, man, I became a foreman and it was kind of telling, you know, people twice my age what to do and how to do it, you know, of course, in a, a courteous way and, uh, you know, being polite to my elders, but you know, I would definitely get the vibe from them that they were just like, man, this kid is half my age, like, and he's my boss, you know, and I, so I, I did that for a while. And then I kind of like hit a ceiling with, with pay, you know, and at the time it was good, but, you know, I was definitely working 40 plus hours a week and didn't have as much time to myself. And, um, you know, after asking my boss for like a raise multiple times and getting denied, I finally was just like, you know, I think at this point I, I want to try to do something that I want to do, you know, and at the time I was just like smoking weed, skateboarding and like rapping on, on beats with my friends. And, um, so I kind of was just like, yeah, let me, let me start making some beats and just play around with it. Not that I wanted to be like a rapper or anything, but I was like seeing myself more on the production side and, uh, I grabbed a keyboard and grabbed some equipment and started playing around with it. Um, I quickly realized that I was in over my head, you know, because it was a, a world that I just wasn't really used to. I don't have a musical background, although, you know, I, I did have an uncle when I was younger that was in a, a metal band and I would play on the drums and just kind of be around the studio and push knobs and stuff like that. But, um, you know, so I was like, I, I hit like a dead end real quick and then I, uh, I decided to get a job at Guitar Center and uh, one of my homies, like, was my in, you know, the guy that I actually bought equipment from there. And um, I figured that would be, like, my schooling, you know, learn the equipment, learn the terminology, and then kind of go from there. You know, it would also put me in a circle of people that kind of knew what they were doing. So without having to pay, you know, thousands of dollars, like, to go to school for audio engineering, I kind of just got a job at Guitar Center. And, um, 
that was actually a really good like pivotal point in my life too because that broke me out of that that intricate mindset um i'm sorry uh introvert mindset and um you know it was a sales uh commission job so the more people i talked to the more my paycheck would be gotcha. you know so i was definitely like hustling there and within a few months i became a manager and um you know, became one of the top salesmen in the whole country, like nationwide. And that's just like my hustle mentality. You know, growing up, I was always like wheeling, dealing, like trading like baseball cards for Sega Genesis and then flip that for a BMX bike or something like that. So, you know, it wasn't it wasn't nothing new to me, the the hustle side of it. But um, yeah, I learned uh, learned about the equipment and, you know, took all the knowledge that I could out of that job and then just decided to open up a studio with one of my buddies. It was kind of already you know, a few years ahead of me doing it. And uh, his name was Doc Strange and uh, great producer, like learned, you know, everything like by himself, never went to school for anything either. And kind of just like picked up the basics from him and then kind of ran with that. And then, um, you know, one of my customers at Guitar Center was uh, this this guy named Nick Flash. He was a (laughs) DJ in the community. Everybody knows him. You know, he's a He's a, he's a homie, 20 years plus, you know, I've known him. And uh, I can honestly say I wouldn't be where I am today without knowing him, you know, without, you know, actually like coming over and teaching me like a, a lesson, I would kind of just like go and help him set up his equipment and stuff like that for like DJ events and then just watch him and like kind of learn the music. And then, you know, we started doing um, a lot of shows and like, you know, networking in Miami and stuff like that. And he kind of opened me up to the culture of DJing. And like, um, that was that was really fun. You know, I had a lot of good times and met a lot of good DJs and stuff like that. And then uh, somewhere along the lines, I picked up a camera to like market my parties. And, and then I realized like how great of a networking tool it was. And uh, I would basically just like hit up DJs that were at shows that I wanted to attend. And basically just be like, hey, you know, let me come in and shoot some photos or video and, um, you know, network with you. And uh, so I did a lot of shows like that for a while. So, you know, I had been DJing, you know, for a good year or two before I actually got good enough, like, to go and make money with it. And uh, Nick also hooked me up with my booking agent, Kenny Mondo, which is like, this guy is a goat, man. Such a great person and... uh, you know, knows everybody here in Palm Beach County and South Florida in general. And, you know, I, uh, another cat that I wouldn't be where I am today without knowing him. And uh, so, yeah, I had been doing the DJing stuff for a while, started shooting some video and pictures and stuff. And, you know, did a lot of great shows with some of the legends, you know, Steve Aoki, Wiz Khalifa, you know, Ying Yang Twins, um, Busta Rhymes, like Little John. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And, um, it was funny one night I was uh, I was telling Nick that that I got this opportunity at Blue Martini in Boca to go shoot social media pictures there four nights a week. And granted, the pay wasn't great. It was only like 100 bucks a night and I'd be out till like five in the morning and it would kind of take away from some of my DJ gigs. But something inside me told me just to go do it and have fun doing it. And uh, everybody told me like that it, it might not be the greatest idea because it's a lot of work. The pay wasn't really rewarding. But um, I decided to go with my gut feeling anyway, and I went and was shooting pictures for them for quite some time. And, like, that's kind of, like, where I started meeting all of these, like, bigger artists that I looked up to and listened to before I even got into creative arts. And um, I met this cat there one night, uh, this cat Tyler Clinton. Now, he's, like, a, a celebrity photographer, but at the time I had no idea who he was. And he asked me if I wanted to take a picture with, uh, you know, some some guests that were celebrating their birthday at Blue Martini. And it, it happened to be this, like, Grammy award-winning record producer named Jim Johnson. Now, Jim has done so much in the music game. Like, he's worked with, like, Beyonce, like, Lil Wayne, uh, ASAP Rocky, Machine Gun Kelly. Like, the list just goes on and on and on. So at the time, I didn't know who he was, but I was just like, all right, I guess I'll take a photo with him. I'm not sure who he is, but, you know, (laughs) here's how you use the camera. I showed him and he was just like, oh, okay, like hit this button. And I'm like, yeah, man, that one. And uh, he ended up being like this, like amazing photographer that I've I've always looked up to. And uh, so so, yeah, I met Jim and uh, 
Tyler started hitting me up to like do videos and stuff like that because I have, you know, I had a lot of equipment at the time. And, uh, so we, uh, we went and shot some stuff for like Yellow Wolf, OT Genesis, um, some, some rappers out of, out of, uh, Tennessee, this guy named, um, Young Struggle and Jelly Roll and stuff like that. So I gathered a lot of experience on set like that way and just, um, you know, that's kind of what like broke me into like shooting more video and having a passion and, and desire to shoot and stuff like that. I feel like video is, is probably where I'll end up, you know, like I feel like as a DJ, you're kind of, you have a window, you know, I, I don't see myself wanting to be a DJ like past like 50 or 60. Yeah. Has, it, has, a, has an expiration date almost. Yeah. In a sense, you know, I mean, there's definitely some older DJs out there that are still killing it, but mm -hmm. You know, if you if you're not producing music as well, you know it's it's only a matter of time before you just get tired of gigging and like yeah. you don't relate to the crowd anymore and stuff like that. So, um, you know, getting into camera works is like is something that I definitely uh, see in my future for sure. And even writing, you know, like I love writing. As a kid, I would always write stories and stuff like that, and take like my favorite characters and make my own like episodes of their shows and stuff, like Ninja Turtles and The Simpsons and stuff like that. So. I could definitely see myself being a writer, like in my latter years. You know, so you, you've always had the creative, the creative bug in you, in a sense, yeah. But didn't really know <laughs> it until you know my mid twenties. Yeah, and it's interesting that you know when you were younger, you were an introvert mindset, but then through the music and through meeting DJ Nick Flash, shout out, um, all of a sudden. After meeting DJ Nick Flash and networking with other people, you started to kind of come out of that shell, you know, and all of a sudden listening to your gut, which is a huge thing, I think. I think more, more people should do that. They have to understand that that's actually something important to be aware of. You all of a sudden got yourself into a situation where you were able to, like, not even try to network. You were being put in situations where there were so many people around you that the networking just happened. Absolutely. Yeah, I could tell, like, taking, like, nightlife photography, like, if I wasn't, you know, being extrovert, like, my pictures would tell the tale of that, mm -hmm. you know, but if I was just out, like, introducing myself and, you know, hey, I'm, a, I'm my name's Russ, I'm here taking photos tonight, you know, I'm not going to take your photo now, but, like, when I come back around, I want you to feel comfortable with me already so I can just get you in the moment, you know, when I would do that and practice that and, and, you know, be extrovert, like, yeah, my fo photos would definitely like crush than crush more than like being like all high and like go into a spot and not want to talk to anybody, yeah. but still have to get photos, you know? Right. Still got to get the job done because you realize that like, yeah, getting high and having the fun and being around the music, that'd be the fun aspect of it. But you realize uh, at a young point that it was business as well. Absolutely. And it sounds like you were fortunate enough, not many people can do this um, in their 20s, but you were fortunate enough to come along to not one, but a couple of passions all rolled up into one. Because yep. you have music, you have the DJing, you have photography, you have the film, like all of this creative, all these different creative outlets are all kind of coming together for you at in the age of 20. And like you said, you've been hustling. That's like your. That's just been in your blood. Absolutely. You just started hustling even harder with multiple facets of creative. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I really commend like some of my creative homies that that you know are crushing it in the film world or just the DJ world, but some of my dudes that that are only behind the camera, like they're so jammed up with work all the time. You know, and, and being a DJ is something that I'm super thankful for because I can have like a good foundation financially and then be more choosy with my film projects. Right. You know, I definitely try to stay in my lane with with anything in life and especially like behind the camera because it's just so time consuming and there's so much like pre-production that goes into, you know, getting getting some quality like video work out of, you know, whatever project that you're working on. I love that you brought that point up, actually, the pre-production and, and the amount of effort and time that it takes. I'm, I'm fairly new at this, at the podcasting um, on YouTube for um, just over two years now. <clears throat> Excuse me. And taking the time to just research what it is you're going after is a lot of time. And then 
trying to learn how to do all the different aspects of it. Like we have Tice, um, you know, usually off the screen, Tice does the editing for the Life Choices podcast. But, you know, here I am researching at the same time how to do the editing, learning how to do Final Cut on my laptop so I know all aspects of it. People don't really realize like how much effort and time it takes to become good at a craft. Absolutely. You know, and the the best bit of advice that I would give to anybody trying to get into this world is surround yourself with people that are already going in the direction that you see yourself going. You know, I always kind of tell people like baseball players aren't hanging out with surfers and like basketball players aren't hanging out with musicians. Usually, you know, they're like usually surrounding themselves with people that, you know, that um, that motivate them and inspire them in the field that they want to be in. I love that. We talk about that regular here on the podcast. We, we talk about how you need to be around the people who are living the life that you want or at the very least be around people who are also trying to level up like you are. Absolutely. It is all about your community. Yeah, dude. And if you're like the smartest person in the room, like you're not in the right room. No. You should always surround yourself with people that are smarter, like wealthier. And, you know, that's how you learn. We live in a monkey see, monkey do environment. And, you know, that's where you get the basics from and then kind of like mold them and shape them into what works for you. Exactly. And the best skill to have when you do put yourself in that room where you're not the smartest person is learn how to listen. Oh, yes. Know when the great opportunity to be silent is there and take it. Absolutely. You know, speaking on that is uh, listening. I I read this book called Just Listen. And like I've learned so much from that book and like how to turn the voice off in your head when you're speaking with somebody because there's more comprehension there. You know, like when we're having a conversation, you and I like it's it's magical because we go back and forth like you speak and I listen and then I wait my turn and then I'm like, okay, I comprehend what he's saying and like, let me rebuttal or reply this way. And then it's just like, goes back and forth. And before you know it, it's like, dude, we've just been talking for like two hours. I gotta go. <laughs> I love it. Like there, there's nothing more that I love than having those conversations. That's a hundred percent. The reason why I'm doing this podcast is I want to be involved in deep conversations with really great people that are successful at whatever it is they're doing. And because of what they've done to get there, you didn't want to become a DJ overnight to become super famous. Infamous. Nah. You wanted to, uh, and this is what I'm observing for the person you are. You wanted to become this amazing DJ so you can bring music into people's lives. And for a couple of hours a night, you can just transform their life into this absolute beautiful happiness. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that like um, a touring DJ would be awesome and doing big festivals would be cool. I don't think it's for me just because I enjoy my time doing the things that I want to do outside of creative arts because there is that balance in life. You know, you got like the work side of you and the business end, but you also should be doing the things that you really love to do, whether it's just like go to the beach or like ride your bike or go snowboarding, which is a passion that like I've recently discovered. And that's what prompted me to move to Colorado. Um I, uh, I was at a car show over here in, in Palm Beach called Cars and Coffee, and I ran into my buddy Griffin Gilman, um, who's crushing the game by now. You know, he's uh, selling houses and stuff like that out here now in South Florida. But at the time, you know, I seen him at the, at the car show, and I just went over that day with my camera to just, like, film a little video for fun. And I was definitely on the fence when I woke up that morning. Like, should I go film? Should I, like, put in the work of, like, you know – getting my gear ready, going over there, shooting, going back, cutting up the footage, editing a video. And then once I edit the video, like, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to push it on Instagram or am I just going to like, let it sit in the archive? But, um, I decided to go with my gut and just go. And, uh, I ran into Griffin there and, um, I used Griff in a video a long time ago for this cat named Vincent. He's a, a pretty decent DJ, like out of, um, out of Del Rey. And uh, he's been on, like, The Bachelor and stuff like that. So he's, he's got some clout and stuff. And uh, one of my other buddies, Jared Noah, um, he's a, a cinematographer. He had hit me up and was like, hey, do you want to help me shoot this video? And uh, there wasn't no money in it or anything involved. So, you know, it, it wasn't like, um, you know, a production like that where I was going to, uh, you know, walk away with some some cheddar. But um, 
I decided to go anyway, you know, because it was like all in the same circle of DJs and stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, let's run it. We shot a video for Vinsane. Griffin was uh, an extra in the video. He had a, a jet ski, so he was like ripping around the intercoastal, and I was like flying my drone and capturing some shots. And long story short, we just stayed like Instagram homies over the years. I ran into him at the car show, Cars and Coffee, and uh, just was chopping it up with him and like asked him what he had going on that week. And he had mentioned that he was going snowboarding at his um, at his property, like in uh, in Vermont. And I was just like, man, I mean, coming from like a surfing skating background, like I've always wanted to snowboard. And I was just like, man, I'd love to go. And he literally told me, he's like, buy a ticket. Like I got a house and, you, you know, you got a place to stay and like it'll be fun. So uh, I rolled out to Vermont with him and uh, stayed at his crib and we went and rode Stratton Resort. And, uh, I mean, the first day was murder, bro. I was like, man, I don't know if snowboarding is for me, dude. Like, I was getting my ass handed to me. But not just that. That night when you go to sleep, like, while you're sleeping, you used muscles that you don't normally use, and all of a sudden they're, they're, they're getting sore, and you're just not sure, what the fuck did I do? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> after that first day, we went back to his crib, and I just went right to the bedroom. Yeah. And, like, I felt like a dog with my tail between my legs. I was so defeated and sore <laughs> and just, like you said, you know, using muscles I never even knew existed. And this is the first time you ever went snowboarding ever? First time, yeah, and, and first you how, day. you were how young? Uh, that was, like, four or five years ago now. I think around, like, 2017. Damn. And, uh, you know, I'm fairly in shape, you know, like I, I run a lot and I hit the gym and eat properly, but still though, like it was, yeah. it was definitely exhausting and, and definitely like put a hurting on my body. Uh, like I said, I went to the room and just like passed out. I'd be like, they knocked on the door for dinner and I was just like, <laughs> no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And I, I was like, seriously, like, I don't think snowboarding is for me, man. I, it's just not my thing. Like, yeah. I, I can't, like, quite figure it out. And, like, I'm surprised because, like, I've skated my whole life. And, uh, I, man, I got to be honest. Something clicked in my brain in the middle of the night. And it was just like, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Like, you'll figure this out and it'll be rewarding. Just give it a minute. Go do it again. And uh, so I went back out the second day and like I hit the bunny slopes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I told them, you know, you guys go ahead, do your thing. Like, um, I'm going to figure this out. Right. And uh, the second day I figured it out. My main thing was like connecting my heel side edge to my toe edge and being able to like carve. And um, second day I figured it out. And by the end of the day, I met back up with them and I went all the way back up the mountain. And uh, we started shredding, and, like, the homies were like, bro, it looks like you've been riding, like, two or three seasons already. Yeah. Just after, like, day two. And then from there, man, it was just, like, it consumed my thoughts. Like, anywhere I w was, like, all I was thinking about was snowboarding and my next trip. And, um, you know, so I took a few more trips, and, you know, that ended up costing, you know, two, $3,000 each time between the plane ticket, like a, a rental car, and, you know, accommodations, your ski pass, like, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a lot. It adds up. And um, I, I was just here in South Florida, and I was just like, man, all I think about is snowboarding. Like, why am I living in Florida? Mm -hmm. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. And... Um, I had, at the time, I was, like, filming some stuff with uh, one of my good partners, uh, Kevin Balejo, which is, he's just, like, one of the smartest people I know. And he comes off so, like, you know, like, not smart, man. And this guy is, like, I've learned so much from him. And, uh, you know, he's a cinematographer and does, like, a lot of 3D animation and stuff like that. And used to be a school teacher for um, a video production class out in California. Anyway, so I'm filming with him, and his brother owns the, the company here in South Florida called Body Details. It's a uh, laser tattoo um, removal and hair removal company. And uh, so we were filming uh, Claudio, one of the, the business partners at uh, FAU. He would go around and, like, teach the business students, you know, just, like, life skills and stuff like that and, you know, a bit of a motivational speaker. So I'm like filming him one day at, at FAU and uh, one of the things that he said just like really stood out and clicked and it was uh, along the lines of like how many days we live on this planet as as uh, humans. And um, I was really quite surprised like when he actually revealed the answer 
And I love asking people this question because, you know, people don't really think about this, you know, but a lot of people like will guess like crazy amounts, like a hundred thousand days two, three hundred thousand days, you know, but the, the, the actual answer is 28,000 days, 28,000 days. The average person is on the rock. Yes. And, uh, for every 20 years that goes by, you can shave off 8,000 days. Damn. You know, and that's like a, a 70 year old life expectancy, you know, mm-hmm. and like if we're if we're lucky, we'll live past that, you know, and right. um, if we're not, we could die tomorrow. You know, so what I gathered out of that is, is like, take those 28,000 days and do something with it that you can like take to the grave. And, um, you know, he was basically telling the kids, like, if you guys have a great idea, like act on it now, because like you don't have all the time in the world like your mom tells you. That's an excellent point. A lot, a lot of our youth is spent being, you know, expressed to us that, you know, or time's on your side. From the time you're born, it's not. It's, it really isn't. It goes quick. Like, yeah. when I look back at the, at the 40 years that I've spent on this planet so far, you know, I do have a lot of memories, so it seems like a long time, but it's like the older you get, the more responsibilities you have, the quicker the time passes mm-hmm. away. You know? I, try, I try to explain that to many people that I know that are under 25 and try to explain that, um, you know, to basically anyone that's willing to listen because most people, you know, they don't want to hear that they don't have a lot of time, but it was yesterday when I was 17. I'm Doesn't 40, it seem I'm that 45. way? Like I was watching, I was watching uh, something yesterday on, on my laptop and it brought in a memory of when I was 17 and I was like, what happened? <laughs> like that was yesterday and, i'm and telling you man when i got to 30 i think that's when the kind of the speed level was turned up yeah you know around 30 it was all of a sudden it went from like about a six to like oh eight and i'm like fuck when i hit 40 i'm just like wow i'm 40 that means i have possibly less than what i have you know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm not saying I'm going to be done at 80, but, you know, life expectancy. So I got to start doing something. It Knowing that time is not on your side is a huge thing to have. Because I think you start living once you realize it. Once you accept the fact, here, here, here's a bit more of a, of a harder thing to swallow for people. You're going to die. A lot of people can't handle that thought. They don't think about it. I'm okay with it. I've already come to grips with the fact that one day I won't be here. Facts. But before I go, I want to build something of worth, not of wealth, of worth. Absolutely. And the only way to do that is start living every single day that you have for you, not selfishly, but for you. Do something today that's going to make you feel good by the end of the day. Exactly. 100%, man. Like I, I agree with that, you know, to the fullest. Um, with with not having all the time in the world, I've I've come to realization that that the days that you have on this planet, you should spend them wisely. Mm-hmm. Have fun. Do the things that you want to do, and you know you'll live a good life. The one who wins is the one who has the most good days. Yeah, I mean you can't take anything with you as far as we know. So not saying don't go after money. M- make money. Yeah, of li- live a live a life that's easier than hard, uh, but do good things and live happy. Absolutely. And go after your passions because that's what's going to make you happy. The people that are lying on their deathbed regretting that they didn't do this, I should have done that, oh, I wish I had, they, they didn't live. And now they're on their deathbed wishing they had. I'm I'm not going to be that person because I'm going after every single thing that I want in life right now. And I'm surrounding myself with people that have been doing that for a large part of their life. Absolutely. You know, that's one thing that like I, I admire about you guys here at the compound between camera and TJ and you is that you guys are, are the epitome of men, you know, like a lot of these guys out here, they don't know how to be men. You know, they think like running around getting money and like, you know, popping bottles and like getting girls is like their definition of a man, but it's like, they can't even change a tire. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can't like make a meal for their lady, Mm -hmm. you know, but when I come over here, I just feel like, like I fit right in, you know, like I definitely think that I'm pretty versatile and like 
you know, a lot of aspects in life, you know, I haven't perfected everything, but when I come over here, I just like look around and I'm just like, man, Cam's killing it. TJ's killing it. Brad's killing it. Like these are the kind of friends that I want to be around and like learn from. Mm -hmm. And we all, we all know like the group of friends that we have, we all know that individually we bring something to the table. Mm -hmm. Not every one of us can do what everyone else can do. You know, it, it, just not the way life is, but we all have common, common goals and we all have things that we enjoy together and we all bring something to the table. We don't like, we've talked about this numerous times on the, on the podcast because a lot of our guests who have been on so far know us as a community and we're all willing to do for others before ourselves and no one keeps a tally of who's done what. And that's, that to me is, I, I didn't have that as, as a, person who was kind of an introvert as a child I didn't have a group of people that I could count on like that I didn't have best friends when I was growing up uh, so once I came into a situation where I did I hold I hold the fuck on to that shit that that is what is important to me not having hundreds of friends right you know what I'm saying because those aren't those are acquaintances yeah, those are exactly. people that come and go but having the tiniest group of people that even right now, I don't want to say I'm stepping away from them, but they understand that I'm trying to create something from nothing right now. And and not one of them has, has why aren't you coming out with this? Why aren't you doing this? You, they get it. They're just letting me do what I got to do right now. And when I know it's time to pause the work, like you mentioned earlier, the work-life balance, I pause, I put my stuff down, and I go out and I hang out with them. But having that, realization that what's important being a man or being human i should say is going after the right things having a close group of friends that you can count on that you're willing to be counted on you know you've you've earned their trust as much as they're earning your trust and then just going after what it is you want to get you know do something with your life that's productive purposeful yeah no, it's a it's a great topic to bring up because I, I've definitely been realizing in the past few years that um, I have a lot of acquaintances and in the line of work that I do, you know, you got to kind of like, you know, shake a lot of hands and kiss a lot of babies. You know, a famous term from Mac Miller, you know, rest mm -hmm. in peace, man. That guy was the fucking goat, bro. Uh, nobody of, of our time is making music like that kid. But um, anyway, it's like, you know, I have these friendships that have lasted like decades where I've never gotten in an argument or a disagreement. Like everything is always like smooth. And uh, as I get older, I look back on those and I'm just like, dude, we've been friends for like 25 years. And I can't remember one time where we, we like disagreed on like a food choice or like where to go tonight or whatever man and like those are the kind of friendships that you got to hang on and that you put your effort into you know yeah. i'm not saying don't you know put effort into the acquaintances and stuff because you know you definitely need a, a community of support mm -hmm. but you know they also have to realize that you know like yo we're cool and stuff like that we don't hang out but like we're still cool yeah you know but like these are these are my family over here. It, like I don't even consider the them friends anymore. Yeah, that's the difference. They're family. They're not. I I don't like using the word best friends. It comes out, you know, it comes out because it's just how you're kind of programmed. But they're family at that point. Uh, I had a a friend growing up in uh, in my university years. I guess you could say his name's Sean Bradford, and he was two years older than me. He still is. Um, and he he brought up a, an excellent point when I was about 22, 23 years old, and he said. It takes zero effort to be nice to everybody. And I was like, all right. He was like, they'll be nice back to you. And if they're not, just walk away from them. Yeah. I was like, all right, bet. Because back then, I was still not the person I am now. Clearly, I was 22, 23. And for the most part back then, I was a selfish person. I can admit that. I was a selfish person in, in a non-positive way. Mm -hmm. I didn't care about, um, you know, the people that I hurt and, this and that but when he said that to me it, it, it kind of started to soak in and made me realize like yeah it takes zero effort to be nice to someone telling someone hey your shirt looks awesome today it takes zero effort but you've changed their day they're they're now thinking in a positive way because you just gave them a compliment don't have to be rude to those acquaintances they're still good people and if they're not walk away 
Yeah, absolutely. I realize that too, you know, especially in a lot of like service jobs. And um, I, I notice people that that kind of go out of their way to be rude or like condescending. And it's just like, for one, you're the one who signed up for the application and got the job here. You know, your your sole job is to be like nice and accommodating and like, go get me ketchup if I want ketchup for my fries or mm-hmm. like whatever, mm-hmm. you know? And and it sucks if they're if they're treated poorly by the by the guest. If the guest is rude and say, Yo, I need a fucking ketchup. Yeah. I get it. You're gonna want to be rude to them. Yeah. But like you said, they signed up. Like you're you're in the service industry. You're a customer service agent basically so a smile sure no problem i'll get that for you can i get you anything else yeah you don't got to be fake about it but at least you know do the job role that you signed up for yeah. and like i'm i feel like i'm pretty good and very aware of of that you know because they probably don't really want to work there it's probably just like a segue getting into something that they're really into or maybe they haven't really figured out what their passions are so they're kind of just like coasting and and you know making money to to survive but i always try to treat like a a waitress or a server with respect and always ask them their name and like you know if i do need something you know i call them by their name and just be like when you have a second could you uh, grab me some whatever it is that i need and, um, you know, I definitely noticed like some of my boys, you know, they'll forget to use simple words like please and thank mm-hmm, you. So mm-hmm. I like I'll always add it in if they like ask for something and then yep. they forget to say please. I'll be like, please, you know, mm-hmm, and like when mm-hmm. they come back with it, I'm like, thank you, Cameron or whatever yeah. their name may be. Well, I like the point you brought up about saying their name. Um, something I came across reading. Uh, it might have been how to how to win friends and influence people by dale carnegie great book oh it's phenomenal eh? so i think it was in that book that i read knowing someone's name or saying their name changes the way that they're going to act or react to you 100 percent. so ever since i read that book every time i'm in any atmosphere at all where someone's wearing a name tag and they're servicing me i always say their name i always say hey how you doing today like if i'm at Publix and i'm going up and you know it says you know and if it's a name I can't pronounce, I say, oh, hey, how are you? And then I try to say, is that right? And they're like, oh, no, it's like this. Like, oh, perfect. And, like, the whole conversation, the whole interaction is completely different. A thousand percent because they, they don't feel like a robot. Exactly. And they may have just had, like, a horrible customer uh, treat them or say something rudely to them that they have to be okay with because, you know, they're the, the, the cash, the, the, they're doing the cash there. And all of a sudden, this complete stranger comes by and says, oh, Hey, Russell, how's your day today? Are you having a good day today? And then, all right, I'll see you next time in here, Russell. Like, just to reaffirm that you know their name. You know, it changes their whole day. Absolutely. I try my hardest to remember people's names. And, you know, meeting so many people, it's it's sometimes hard. But, like, a face is one thing that I have a hard time forgetting, you know. And mm. like, there's always that weird awkwardness when you don't remember somebody's name. And, like, you try to be like, hey, uh how do you spell your name? I, I want to make sure I have your number in my phone or like yeah, you try to ben. introduce it's them. Ben, B-E-N. <laughs> <laughs> or you like try to introduce them to like one of your friends yeah. to hope that they'll introduce themselves. Yeah. So you'd be like, oh yeah, his name was uh, Ben. I forgot, man. Funny story. Um, my buddy's uh, bar, Roxy's, which is where we all met. Um, I used to go in there a lot. It's a, it's a place that a lot of people that work on boats go to because it's like just right up the street from the marinas and there was this one gentleman and honestly i still don't know his name he had come in there like probably for like six seven months every couple of weeks whatever and that's when i was pretty much had an alcohol problem so like i was drunk every day um not at work but at night every night um and he would come in and he was like hey bradley how you doing and every time i would never remember this cat's name like just never remembered it and i, I did that like i'd be like oh you know introduce yourself introduce yourself and then you know they wouldn't give his name he's like oh nice to meet you and eventually i i don't know he must have moved back home wherever country he was from because i haven't seen him the face i would remember always could never remember his name and this book taught me like a couple of tricks that, that says that like when you introduce when, when you meet someone, you should shake their hand firmly, obviously, and, and repeat their name when they say it. Then within a sentence or two, you should say something with their name in it again. And that practice actually embeds their name into your brain. Yeah. So I, I, that's what I do now. I try to, you know. Make it a routine yeah. to really like lock in their name by, yeah. 
by using the practices. What book was that? I think it was in, in that one. I mean, I read so many books and then I pull so many tidbits from, yeah. from all of them. Like I don't remember every word from every book I've read, but there's something from every book that I've taken and implemented into my life. And that's, that's something that I do to become successful at what I do. And that's what I'm reading is I try to take information in and then implement those ideas as practices in my life so that I can become a better person. I'm not saying if you did it, it's going to work for you. Right. I'm, I'm saying I do that so that I can become better as a person because the next time I meet someone in a situation like that, I don't want to forget their name. I want to be the one to say, hey, Michael, how you doing? It's been a while. How you been? Because that, again, it does something for that person that it makes them feel good that you remembered who they exactly. are. Exactly. Same thing with the conversation thing, you know, like when it's a two way street, you walk away and you're just like, man, I really enjoyed that conversation. Like I feel like Bradley felt where I was coming from, mm -hmm. you know, or vice versa. Well, for me, for me, what I do is like, obviously I have deep conversations with people I gravitate to. And so if I'm gravitating to you for whatever reason, my inner self, my inner being is telling me that this person might have the same type of mindset, the same outlook on life, which means they may have gone through similar shit that I went through because we all go through shit. There's not one person out there that isn't going through something. Right. And, and those who are of a good mindset and those who are at peace with themselves, those who are working at becoming better human beings, they've already faced the adversity head on. They've decided to look at exactly what the shit is and work on it. So when I meet people like that and they have a similar mindset. I already, my mind goes right to, okay, they've gone through some shit. Mm. So, so this person is probably gonna be able to communicate really well with me. And then I create a, an inner love for that person. Like I'm excited when I find out you're in town because I know that while you're in town, you're either going to pop by here or somehow we're going to, we're going to connect somehow and we're going to have a conversation. And every time we do, is it the same? Is it similar? It has some idea of, of what we like to talk about, but it's always new at the same time. Yeah. And I, I do. I walk away energized. Yeah. And, and, and oh, to have that feeling after having a conversation with someone, how many times, especially in your field, have you had nonsense conversations? Oh, man. Like, it gets to the point where I'm, I just, like, tune out. I do my best to stay in, in tune. But when it's not that two-way street, man, it's just like... I start thinking about 28,000 days on this planet, man. And like, I can't be wasting this time here with this person that just wants to talk over me and wants to like, you know, I, I say one thing and it like sparks like a, a memory of like something similar that they went through. And it just, it's, it's totally out of sync, you know, like conversations are like a tango, you know? And like, if you don't have the steps down, it's just like, you're going to be stepping on each other's toes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hear you on that. I love, I love it. Our conversations are always not just welcoming, but they're actually informative. Because every time we, we have a conversation, I, I actually take something from it and mm -hmm. I learn something. Whether it's I learn something about you or I learn something about myself or I learn about a new practice that I could probably implement. Because even though you're younger than me only by like, you know, four years, and this is, this is an important factor, I know myself, I can learn so much from anybody. It doesn't matter their age, doesn't matter their background, doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. They have something to teach me. Otherwise, they wouldn't be coming into my life. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I, that's what I take from our conversations. And I, I love them. They, they just make me feel good. Yeah, you have to be aware of that. You know, like when you're, when you're conversing with, with people is like, what can you take out of it besides just a good conversation, you know, or, or time with that person? And like... Like you said, you know, like uh, you can take a lot out of younger cats, man. Like I know this cat out in, in Colorado named Eli. He's one of my best friends out there. You know, he's like 24. And uh, he's taught me so much stuff about like the mountain and, you know, just different techniques, like whether it's like winter sports or summer activities, you know. And, and uh, for being 24, I feel like this kid has lived like two lifetimes already. Mm. You he know, may, he may have. He probably has, man. And uh, I've recently been teaching him to DJ. And out of all the people that I've ever taught to DJ, this kid has picked it up the quickest. Like, I already have him gigging for me and stuff. He's actually covering gigs for me while I'm here in Florida for the whole month of May. And, um, you know, people around town are, like, starting to catch on to, like, he's becoming a DJ. And um, it feels good to, like, teach something to somebody that, like, they can 
that they could take with them forever, you know? And I think that like we were, we were talking about, you know, like one day we're going to die and, uh, I'm completely cool with dying. Like Mm -hmm. I know that it's Mm -hmm. something that, that we have to accept. And like, I've, I've been doing my best to like have fun while I'm here and make memories with people and, you know, teach people like the craft of, you know, photography, video or DJing, or even if it's just like, you know, teaching them to go chase their dreams and like, you know, follow their, their intuition and stuff like that. I feel like at the end of the day, that's the only way you can live forever, Mm -hmm. you know, is like being like a person like Albert Einstein or Leonardo da Vinci or something like that. Like, those those people like did something that really helped like humanity out you know and like you can pretty much bring those names up to anybody on this planet and they're going to know who they are they've become immortal right yeah it's the only way to live forever through doing good deeds exactly not necessarily i don't know them i don't know if they were good people because some of the smartest people that have created amazing things have not been the nicest human beings to others but that being said creating a legacy to leave behind once you're gone of just being as good as you can and, and leaving something again of purpose, something of worth rather than wealth. I'm not saying you don't want to leave wealth. I would love to leave lots of things to lots of people, but to be able to teach, which I love that you brought that up because I feel like you've had so many passions in your life that you've gone after in a business sense and become successful with them photography video djing teaching which is so important i I think most of us are teachers whether we go to teaching school or not we have the ability to teach somebody something and the fact that you're able to teach someone one of the crafts that you've mastered because you've done it every day for a long period of time without we don't we don't get we don't get the recognition. We don't get the success. We don't get the money right away when you're going after mastering something. Right. You have to be okay with waiting for it to come. Absolutely. But I feel like maybe teaching is another passion of yours because I saw the way your face lit up, how this kid you know, is 24 and you've taught him how to DJ and the fact that you've got him covering gigs while you're here. Like That's a phenomenal, th- that's just a great thing to do as a human being. But then to have that kind of like light in you come out when you speak about it i think teaching is one of the coolest things out there no it really is uh one of my friends emily runs a a a summer camp for kids and uh she's been booking me for probably like the past like 15 years to come dj events for the school and stuff like that sometimes shoot photos for like you know family night and stuff and then we got to this point where she was like all right well i want to get you some money while you're in town um i have you know these few dates for you to dj and shoot photos but like we have a budget that we could give you if, what do you want to do? Do you want to just like come be a motivational speaker to some of the kids? And, uh, I had never done it before, but I was like, sure, why not? And it wasn't really about the money. It was just being able to, you know, connect with the the youth and be able to kind of maybe be an inspiration and, and guide them in the right direction. Uh, so I went and like, you know, did these, these teaching seminars or whatever, and I didn't have no kind of curriculum like prepared or what I was going to talk about. But, you know, I kind of went into it with the same mentality that we're having right now, just about life's path and stuff like that and and choosing, you know, your life choices wisely and uh, not not like, you know, conforming to the system and, and ending up in a job or a, a career that you're not happy with. Mm-hmm. You know, and one of the first things that I, I did when I was was talking to these kids was just like I went around and had everybody introduce themselves and and tell me what they like, you know, and what they don't like. And uh, it was interesting to, to hear what some of the kids had to say. And, you know, the ones that that really stood out to me, um, you know, I, I, I spent a little bit more time with because you could tell some of the kids didn't really take it serious. They were just like, man, I'm ready for lunch. I'm ready to go <laughs> home and play like. But some of them were actually like, you know, um, picking up what I was putting down. And then uh, I kind of went into my life and like what what I like to do and how I got into creative arts. And like I had some some DJ equipment there. So like I showed them how to set up the equipment, explain to them what everything does and then kind of, uh, broke down the structure of music and, 
you know, I, I let them jump on the turntables and like play around and stuff like that and scratch records and stuff. And, you know, the, the time went by fast. I was, uh, I wasn't worried about like, man, how am I going to like keep these kids uh, entertained for two hours? You know, it, it, the time went by quick and we had a great time and it was something that I really enjoyed doing. It made you feel really good. Inside, yeah, right. For sure. Almost made you feel like a kid again, too. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, that's a big thing, man. Like, I feel like in society, we're like forced to grow up quicker than we want to. Mm -hmm. you know and like you got to be like cool and you can't watch cartoons as an adult or like collect action figures still or comic books <laughs> like, and our boy dj nick flash man he collects all that shit still eh? dude him he and i are it. some <laughs> geeks bro like if you saw my place man you'd be like bro are it. you like seven years old at heart that's <laughs> like, amazing and i would say yes i am still yeah you know like when i look back at at my life i'm like i still see myself as like this young kid and like you know, like sometimes when I walk by the mirror and I see like a, a beard and dreadlocks down to my ass and shit and tattoos everywhere, I'm just like, whoa, dude, I had a scary, scary situation yesterday. Actually, I was uh, I was laying down watching something and I started laughing and th th this this part isn't like the scary part, but I, I started laughing and I was like, literally, as soon as I did the way I laughed, the way I used my hand, everything, I was like, I literally saw my dad, you know, it was past like five years ago. But, um, like, when I was a kid in the living room watching a movie with my dad and you know, him laughing, like, I have that memory. And I saw that. But I saw that here, like, me. Which isn't surprised because my mom always called me Little Arthur. All of their friends always said, oh, my God, he's the spitting image of you, Arthur. But what was weird was, like, I saw myself as I am at this age, which was weird. I see what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I saw, I, like for the first time, I kind of had an out-of-body experience where I saw myself as a 45-year-old laughing at a, at a movie and then i'm just like but i don't feel like that 99 percent of the day like i feel like i'm 19 yeah like, like there's nothing about my life besides responsibility that makes me feel like i'm a 45 year old tj is one person that i know to this right now today that still holds on to his childlike enthusiasm better than anybody i know dude he's a big kid for right? sure right and he's 33 years young but he, he literally has not let go of what it's like to be a kid, which I look up to. And he's younger. He's 12 years younger than me. I look up to him in that aspect. Like, he bought a, he bought a remote control uh, car that he had when he was a child. And when he got this thing, I mean, his, it was like as if it was like his seventh-year-old kid Christmas present. You know yeah. what I mean? Like out of the box just super excited lit up lit up like and you look at that and you're like you are going to live so much longer than everyone else we know i think so too man you know you hold on to that youth you know nobody says that you have to grow up i mean obviously you have responsibilities as an adult to you know provide a foundation you know for you to live and you know food to survive and stuff like that mm -hmm. but you know outside of that man do the things that you love you know, like make the memories that make you happy. So like, you know, you live a long time, like you're saying. Keep your inner being as a child. Don't be fiscally irresponsible. Of course. You know, make sure your bills are paid. Make sure you got food on the table, clothes on your back. But you don't got to spend 10,000 bucks on a t-shirt. No. You know, you can just have a t-shirt. Yeah. Absolutely. And and those, those, uh, the way we are told to grow up so quick is, is so wrong. Like, like I couldn't agree with you more on that topic. And anyone that has that childlike enthusiasm at an older age, the thing that we celebrate often here is zero fucks given, right? It's very hard for most people to uh, let go of what other people think or say about them, mm -hmm. you know? And when someone else, uh, you know, might make fun of TJ for, for that child like enthusiasm if i'm in the area i just pipe up and say yeah but he's gonna live longer than any of us because he has that childlike enthusiasm facts like like i'm able to do that because i've stopped worrying about what other people think yeah. now i have to imagine in your industry i've had this talk because uh, nick was on the show as well before uh you're in an industry which even though you are now 41 i want to say is a younger cat's game right 
Yeah, for the most part. For the most part. I mean, once you get older and you don't want to be traveling as much and running around because you might have other aspects of your life that you want to have stationary, uh, it's easier to do all that stuff when you are in your 20s and your 30s Mm -hmm. and you're able to run around and drink all night and wake up the next day and do another event. Um, At what point, or maybe it was never an issue for you, uh, did you ever have that, um, that worry about like, oh, I should wear this or oh, I, oh, I shouldn't do that. Like, were you worrying about what other people were thinking or saying? Yeah, I mean, it, you, you definitely have an image and you want to upkeep it and stuff like that. So, you know, having a, a, a sick wardrobe and, you know, being ha- having like, um, you know, a fresh haircut or whatever, you know, definitely is is a part of it. Um it wasn't one that I really cared about like that much um, until maybe like recently uh, past like four or five years or so, maybe a little bit longer. But um, I, uh, I, I haven't smoked weed or drank in like almost two years now. And it's like my my addictive personality is kind of shift over into like wardrobe and collectibles and shoes and you know, so I'm a big sneakerhead. I have like probably, fuck, I don't even know how many pairs, but like <laughs> more I'm, than needed. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing the you know the the worth of uh, my shoe collection is probably up around 20k, and um, I've been uh, I've been copping like a bunch of uh, throwback uh, streetwear and stuff like that, like Stussy and um, Nike ACG and just different brands like that, and. Um, it's, it's also an investment to me too. You know, a lot of people are playing around with the stock market and playing around with, you know, um, uh, cryptocurrency and stuff like that. And, um, I've, I've just been like dumping some money into like wardrobe and stuff like that. So it is cool to have like some, some dope threads to wear while I'm DJing. But when I'm not DJing, I'm wearing like regular clothes, you know, Mm. a $20 shirt, a pair of shorts that I've had for five, six years. And like, my $80 uh, Nike Janowskis. And then the easiest things when you wake up, you just pick them right out of the closet. There's no thought process. Yeah, like, exactly. Boom, boom, boom. I'm comfortable. And it don't matter because the people I'm going to be around aren't going to give a fuck what I'm wearing. Exactly. And if they do, they're not the kind of people I want to be fucking around. One hundo. The cat that I mentioned earlier, Ty- Tyler Clinton, the, uh, the camera guy that I was telling you about, he literally has Dickie's shirt, Dickie's pants, he like removes the tag from them, gets them dry cleaned, but like literally wears the same outfit every day. Yeah. You know, he'll have like, you know, 10 or 12 of those outfits in his wardrobe and he just literally wears the same shit every day. And dude. he's like, dude, I don't have to think about what I'm going to wear every day. I know. Dude, I have in the past two years since I launched uh, the Life Choices company, I could probably count on my two hands, not using all my fingers, how many times I've not worn my t-shirt. I just, I mean, I get them made, obviously. I buy them in bulk. And then I have three colors. I have white, I have blue, and I have black. And that's it. And yeah. then I have these sweat shorts in different colors. And I got to be honest with you, most of the times, I just throw the black t-shirt on and the black shorts. Because I don't give a fuck. Yeah, it's simple. I'm comfortable in it. It's who I am. It's what I'm, like, building. And I'm, I'm, I just don't care anymore. Like, I don't want to say I don't care in a bad way. I don't care about putting energy into something like that when I can literally just take it out of my closet, put it on, and get the fuck out the door. And go yeah, get up, get it on yeah. about your day. No, it's so true, man. Um, that I think it's the environment too. And I actually wanted to like touch base on something that that I've like kind of developed in the past few years is that life is kind of like the high school lunchroom. Fuck yeah. You just want to fit in, whether it be at this table, that table, or the one across the cafeteria, you know, you want to be accepted. So a lot of times in our community, you know, especially here in South Florida, like you want to be accepted with the nice car, the nice house, the good job, you know, the, the, the physical fitness. And a lot of it is just to go out and be accepted by women or like peers, Mm-hmm. You know, and when you kind of like realize that and you remove that mentality and and you just do the things that make you happy, like you start winning, you start excelling in directions that you never knew existed. And like, you know, I, I make pretty decent money and I could afford a nice like BMW or Mercedes or something along those lines. But, 
Man, all my vehicles are from the 90s and 2000s. Dude, I wouldn't trade your whip for anything. I love my little 96 <laughs> two-door Tahoe slammed on the ground. And, like, dude, I'll pick chicks up and they'll be like, what is this? Like, what are we driving in a low rider? Like, does this thing got switches? And I'm just like, yo, I love this shit. Like, when I drive my truck, it, like, brings a level of happiness that, like, I can't describe. Like, I want to be buried in my Tahoe. But you know what a good point about that is, though? You're driving that car for you. Exactly. You're not driving it for anybody else. 100%. I was, I was just telling this chick last night, like, it's funny. I'll pull up to, like, PGA National to DJ an event. My car will be in the valet loop, and, like, there will be gentlemen there, like, picking up their Ferraris and Porsches Lam- and stuff like that. everything, man. Yeah. And, yeah. dude, they're all huddled up around yeah. my truck, like, talking to each other about it. And then when they realize it's mine, we'll have a half-hour conversation about my truck. Yeah. And I'm like, look yeah, at yeah, your yeah, Ferrari yeah. over there. Like, <laughs> what about that? And they're just like, ah, but this yeah, thing whatever. is cool, though. <laughs> Facts, man. It's so true. When you when you have something older, classic, uh, you know, in nineties. I mean, once it hits thirty or thirty five years old, it becomes a classic. Absolutely. Um, it, there's something to be said about that. It amongst. I don't want to single out women because there's some women out there that are, are car people, but amongst men, it, it's almost like yeah, you get a bit more respect when you have that older vehicle. Oh yeah. You know, even even though you might be able to afford a, a fancier one or maybe that gentleman like you said has the the super expensive vehicle, there, there's just a respect given because it's like, "Well, dude, that's a sick ride." Exactly. Yeah. It it's w- what you just said uh a moment ago and two moments ago actually, like how you don't smoke weed or drink for for 2 years now. Mhm. As I've actually like just a couple of days ago decided to myself and uh, when this is aired, it might be in a, in a, in a couple of weeks from now because we have, I think, four more episodes coming out before we do this one. Um, I've chosen to do 90 days uh, for myself of no, I mean, I don't smoke weed because the job I have, I haven't smoked weed since October, I think. Um, but the job I have, I can't smoke weed. We get drug tested. But I've decided to, to cut out uh, alcohol, drugs, uh, pornography, just all all things that can at times take away from what you're trying to get done. Absolutely. I'm not saying you can't be successful by partaking in these items. I'm just saying for me, what I know is good for me is focusing more on what I want to get done and not doing the things I shouldn't be doing anymore that I know. Like, um, let's just say a week ago, had a couple of drinks, had four or five drinks one night, right? Just having some bourbon, just catching up with a friend. And the next day I was completely done. I couldn't do anything. I chose to sit on my fucking ass all day long. Mm-hmm. Now, some would say, oh, but you need that sometimes. Like, yeah, I get that. I, sometimes, yeah, I should just maybe take the boat out and, you know, chill, whatever. That's different, you know. But the fact that I couldn't do anything because my brain wasn't working properly, I didn't have the energy to do something, and and knowing that's because I had four drinks. Now, yeah. now when I was an alcoholic, I could have 12 drinks in a night, wake up and go to work no problem and do it again the next night but that's not me anymore right so so being that you've you've taken two years off and i have to imagine that not just your success as doing what you do but the other opportunities that have come along because you also uh run a hotel up in, Mm. in, in colorado um all of these things have happened uh because you probably weren't doing those other things yeah, I can. One thing I can definitely chalk up to being sober is being a better DJ. Like since I've uh, stopped smoking and drinking, like I'm really dialed into the music. Like I don't have short term memory loss, so I can I can like know where I want to end up musically and get there quickly without a hitch. Mm-hmm. You know, like I can remember the name of songs. I can, you know play a song in confidence and not like feel like I'm second guessing myself. How is the crowd going to react to this? And so that part I can definitely say um, it's made me better. Um, I've pretty much smoked weed my whole life. I never was a big drinker and still until I started DJing and nightclubs and stuff like that and hanging out like in that social environment. And, um, you know, I've never been an alcoholic, but I've definitely been a very casual drinker having, you know, drinks three to five nights a week. Um, smoking weed, I've pretty much done everything that I've ever done and accomplished like on weed. Like I'm a very functioning pothead. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But I, what I, it really comes down to is time management. Right. Okay. Like when I think about all the times that I take to sit down and smoke weed, you know, it takes me 20 minutes to smoke a joint, you know, from the start of breaking up the weed to throwing the ash, uh, the, the joint in the ashtray, um, 20 minutes there. And then instead of getting right to work like I want to, you know, whether it be a video edit or grabbing some new music, I jump on my phone and start scrolling on Instagram. And then I'm like, oh, shit, I'm kind of hungry now. And then I go spend 30, <laughs> 40 minutes making food. So, like, if I smoke five times a day, like, there's, like, five hours, like, that I wasn't productive. Heard. So now I can definitely say that, like, when I have a task... I just do it instead of being like, oh, I want to smoke some weed first and then I can sit down and relax and work on a video edit or like even going on an adventure, mm -hmm. you know, like thinking that like, oh, this adventure will be better if I smoke some weed, you know, or like relying on, you know, weed or alcohol for dealing with an issue in my life, mm -hmm. you know, like I've kind of come to the realization that I want to make sure that I'm still in control of my thoughts and my behaviors and stuff like that. And I'm not using weed or alcohol as a crutch. So if I'm going through something like I sit down and process it and, and deal with it quickly and get back to being happy. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have a task at hand, like I just do it. Like, I'm just like, just get it done. Like what yeah. else are you going to do? Sit on the couch and watch TV? Mm -hmm. Like, no, like just get it done. So um, it's, it's been great in that aspect that like I'm, I'm in self-control and like I'm in control of my thoughts, which I think is a big thing, you know, like we, we like ha have a big issue with, with mental health in, you know, in the United States and worldwide really. And I think that a lot of it has to do with being in control of our thoughts. Like our thoughts lead to like our emotions and our emotions lead to our behaviors, you know, so like if you're in a bad mood and you have nothing else going on to occupy your time and your thoughts, like you're going to sulk in it and you're going to like think about those bad things like till they eat you up. And then you go out on the mountain to snowboard and you end up trying a trick that you would never try before and you hurt yourself mm -hmm. or like I've gotten pissed off at something and then like didn't occupy my time to change my thought process and then jumped on my motorcycle, pissed off, and was doing 170 down I-95 yep. and maybe almost, like, got in an accident or something, you know? So I think it's very important to, like, think about when you're going through something, you know, to think about something else and do something else that makes you happy. And, and I'm not saying, like, sweep it under the rug, whatever mm -hmm. the issue mm -hmm. is. Deal with it really fast, get over it, and move on to something else because... You only have 28,000 days on this planet if you're lucky. <laughs> right, yeah. Move on to happiness, you know. Yeah. Like, I also feel like when you're happy, you attract more positivity and more things, like, good happen to you. That's just fact. So as far as, like, the opportunities and stuff like that and, um, you know, whether they've come from not smoking and drinking, I think that in a sense, yes, because my mind is more clear and I'm I'm dealing with, you know, the things that come at me in a quicker rate and getting back to being happy and then something else opens up. Mm -hmm. I always tell people like, think about it like this. Like when was the last time you found a hundred dollars on the ground while you've been in a pissed off mood? Yeah, never. Anytime I've ever found money on the ground, it's because I was already having a good time and then boom, here comes some icing on the cake, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, you know, karma's a bitch, you know? Yeah, so yeah. doing the right thing, you know, you'll get what you put in. That's for sure. hundred percent. And uh, a couple things to to validate what you were saying. When I was in my 20s, um, I mean, I started smoking weed when I was September going into grade eight. I've told the story on the podcast before. And I smoked every day of my life pretty much until I was close to about 30 years old. And I was a functioning pot smoker. Like me and my boy, Sean, we would we'd go grocery shopping like a normal person, not like I'm stoned and I got to buy a bag of chips. <laughs> we would go and pay our bills and like we would like we would go out during the day and we would get all of our shit done mm. even though we were high. Like there's millions of people in the world that smoke weed every day and are super successful, um, you know, beyond success. Totally possible. When about a year ago, I took myself away from exactly what you were saying, sitting in front of the TV, laying on the couch and procrastinating. 
now I, I barely, if I watch something and I, I don't even watch what I watch on the TV, which you could now like off of YouTube when I'm researching for like podcasting and growing a business and all that sort of informational stuff, I could watch it on my TV and lay on my couch and just phase out on it. But I actually do it on my laptop at the table because I feel like that's like my office, my desk. This is where I'm going to get my work done. Yeah. And that, that for me is very important. Like knowing that you have to get tasks done and a topic that I'm sure you wanted to talk about is distractions. Oh yeah. We have lots of them in our life and knowing how to navigate through them so that you don't get taken off your course um, but I'm going to backtrack for a quick sec before we get into that, how you said about, uh, your thoughts and mental health, huge thing around the whole world. And I think in the past couple of years, it's something that more visible people have been talking about. They've been using the platforms for the right reasons and trying to discuss openly about how many of us deal with mental health issues. There's nothing wrong with it. It's fully like when someone tells me, like when a friend of mine tells me, uh, oh yeah, I know I can't make it tomorrow because I got to go and you know, I'm going to therapy. I'm like, oh, I fucking love that. And their first response is usually like, oh really? I was like, fuck yeah, I love the fact that you, you, you're you telling me right now you go to therapy. That is amazing. I love anybody that goes to deal with their thoughts in an open forum so that they can get better at whatever it is they're trying to get better at. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this platform is is I can't tell you how, how to get better. I, I don't know how you weren't good you know right. what i'm saying i can tell you what i did to get better i can tell you what i do on a daily basis to uh prevent the negative thoughts from coming into my head because i wake up some days and i don't want to go out that door there are some days where i literally do not want to interact with a single human being but when that cloud comes over me i start thinking about what do i have today that i'm so grateful for and I'm not sweeping it under the rug. I'm just trying to shift the negative thought from coming in and, and replacing it with a positive thought. So I wake up and I'm like, you know what? I'm grateful. Like I got these guys that I live around that are just wicked good human beings. And I'm so grateful that I get to spend time with them. You know, something simple as that. Or I wake up and I'm like, you know what? I woke up. I'm fucking grateful for that. And I try, and that's how I try to keep my mental health on a positive side. That's what I do to get through my days of cloudy depression because mm -hmm. I can fully admit it. I have depression. I deal with that not as regular as I used to because I've implemented practices that work for me in order to get past that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not afraid to be vulnerable and to show my viewers that I have that. Yeah. I, I just I just want people to understand it's okay that you do figure out how you can get better or how you can stop the negative thoughts from coming in. Exactly. Now, now speaking about uh, what we were going to get into a little bit ago, saying that you've accomplished all these things, uh, you know, distractions come into our life. And, and as maybe you know, one final good topic here to chat about is you know, distractions as they are, whether they were when you're younger, when you were starting out in, in the DJing scene or the video in the film, um, or even now, like what, what are these distractions? How do you deal with these distractions? Um, you know, how to overcome them when they do come at you. Yeah, I would say my biggest distraction has always been women. <laughs> I love women. I'm with you on that one, man. They take oh, so much man. of my time. They do, you know, but it's like I've I've also always found like inspiration like uh, in my creative world that comes from like hanging out with women and like experiencing things with 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 girls, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, that would be like my main distraction. And you know, what's funny, like where I live in the mountains in, in Breckenridge, Colorado, the guy to girl ratio is really messed up. There's mm -hmm. a lot of dudes out there and there's not so many girls. And what's, what I've been noticing is, is that these girls are getting chased around by so many dudes and they have so many options and, you know, any that I'm that I even show like interest in that I'm like this this girl's like pretty she seems cool has something going for herself let me try to talk to her so you know I'll I'll like I'll rap at her or whatever and she'll be with it and then when it comes time to like you know hanging out and kicking it and going on an adventure or something 
they like go ghost or like they don't answer or whatever have you. And then I see them with some buster ass dude like a week <laughs> later and I'm just like, really? Like, wow, I dodged a bullet because like you got yeah. some really low standards. Yeah. You know, and I'm not talking shit about the homies out there, but I'm just saying that like, you know, it's 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 actually a bit of a relief that they do that. Right. Because then I have more time to focus on the shit that I want to do, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's like cook a meal at home or read a book or go snowboarding or go on a trip or like do just do something creative or just hang out by myself and not hear anybody talk. You right. know? Yeah. So it, it's actually pretty nice. And like I'm starting to enjoy it more. And then like when I do pull a chick, I actually like uh, am more. um like, I enjoy it that much more. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, uh, like here in South Florida, I go out and I'm just like, Jesus Christ, man, I would never get anything done living in Florida again. Mm. Like, there's just beautiful women everywhere. Everywhere. Absolutely you know? everywhere. It, it, you know, it, it is very much distracting. Like, it, it's, <clears throat> I can't speak on, on successful relationships because I haven't had one, clearly. I'm single. If I didn't, then I'd be with someone. But, uh, but, I do know myself very well, and, and when I do meet a young lady, um, yeah, I do seem to get, mm, what's the word? I get uh, consumed, mm-hmm. consumed by, uh, you know, time, you know, with them, basically. And and it's unfortunate. I've had to learn myself that, like, listen, you're trying to get something done, so distractions you need not in your life. And I figured out which things are the biggest distractions in my life. And then I don't put myself in a situation to be distracted, which is difficult because if you're a human being and you're out in the world, you're going to come across different people. And I love women to death. Like, like I adore women. And what I've found is I'm great one-on-one. I'm not a big, like out in the public with everybody else. And you're with your boys and there's girls there and oh, that girl's looking at you. And it's like, "Mm." you know, I, I, I don't like talking over, music you know i like having a conversation obviously so i actually have just pulled myself out of the whole game to be quite honest with you i don't go out that much anymore when i do go out to get away from working all the time it's more like go to the beach with my dog take my dog for a walk uh go to the gym if my boys want to go out and grab some dinner somewhere uh, i do those sort of things because i just I'm really focused right now and I just don't want distractions. But at the same time, I love the attention from a woman. Yeah. Like I really do. But I've found now in the, in let's call it, I want to say I'm in the spring or the summer of my life, you know, definitely not in the winter yet because I got some time still. I'm hoping, um, I find that I rather connect with them differently, Mm -hmm. you know, and I find that it's hard to do that because where you have to go to find these connections with them. Yeah. That, that that's for me. I I'm in the gym every day. It's awkward to go up to a girl in a gym, Absolutely. you know, like unless they're into you because if they're into you then they're totally fine with you coming up to them. Right. But um I I try not to do it like if if someone's genuinely like getting it at the gym, I might go up to them and be like, "Listen, I got to be straight up honest with you. I've seen you here like every day for a couple months. You're killing it." And that's genuinely me just telling that girl, you're killing it. Like, keep it up. Like, I'm I'm motivated to gym because I see how hard you work every day. Mm. But um, I'm not in any forum, I guess, often enough uh, to to meet anybody, you know. And 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 I'm not upset with it right now because I do have something else that's on my mind, which is trying to get you know an empire built, basically. Yeah. Uh, distractions are everywhere, and and for us men, it's not just women, but. It, I have to admit, you know, it is probably one of the bigger distractions that most men have, mm-hmm. you know, because we do want, whether it's love, lust, you want something absolutely you know, from them. Um, has there been any other distractions in, in your life when it comes to like getting your business done? Mm. Younger when I sold weed, you yeah. know, when I was a, a younger cat and I sold weed, you know, like that was like a bit of a distraction. I'd be wanting to work on something creatively and then have to go drop a bag off to somebody or something right, like that. Yeah. But 
Um, I haven't sold weed in a long time and it's like really nice. Yeah. Cause yeah. that was a full time job by itself, man. And, uh, you know, I only sold weed because I wanted to smoke good weed and not have to spend yeah. a bunch of money on it. But I think that's why we all did it. I yeah. Mean, like, I, I sold weed when I was in my twenties and, and I was selling weed basically more or less at my house and at my job. I was a dishwasher. I didn't want to be a, on the line. You know, I got a job at a restaurant where I was like, can you just put me in the dish pit? And they're like, but you have experience. I'm like, yeah, I just, I'm good with the dish pit. Uh, and I knew what I was doing on the side. So I was like, I don't really need more money. It's more like my friends are giving me shit because I'm not working. But yet my friends that are giving me shit for not working are buying the weed off of me. Yeah. You know, like I lived with eight guys at the time and it was, it was anyhow. And um, every one of them was buying weed off of me. You know, I'd get the knock on the door at three in the morning. Wake up. It's your fucking job to give me my weed. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, before you go out to the bar, you're going to want weed when you get home because you're going to pull a girl and you're going to want to like smoke weed with her. Yeah. So order your shit before you go. Yeah. But yeah, I, I did it to, to pay rent and, uh, and smoke for free. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it did distract me from doing anything else though. Cause I didn't want to do anything else. Cause I had this income of paying my rent on time and, and getting high every day. And yeah. It was awesome. What about you? What are some other distractions that you see um, yourself like battling? I mean, there there are distractions that I've pulled away from, like one being like I grew up just sitting in front of the TV, like that's pretty much what I did in my entire life. And I'd have to say over the past like five or seven years, uh, I don't sit in front of the TV anymore. I mean, I watch things on, you know. The, the laptop, but I'm not watching TV shows. I'm watching information to become better at what I'm trying right. to build. Um, I mean, honestly, the biggest distraction is the, uh, oh, what do they call it? It's the, um, it's the silly shit you do at home to just not do your work. It, it, there's a certain term for it. Procrastination? Well, no, no, but there's a certain word, busy work. I okay. do all the busy work. That distracts me. So, like, when I'm gone for, like, three weeks or a month because, like, I come in and out of port because, you know, working on the on the, on the the yachts, I got, I got to, you know, leave the country quite often. And when I get back, there's a bunch of, like, normal day-to-day -day shit that I haven't done in a while, right? So I'll come back and I'll, I'll detail my room, right? You know, dust my room, water my plants, uh, reorganize the kitchen, like, clean, like, detail. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just, like busy work do all yeah. the laundry and like i and i try to get all those things done in one or two full days like i even have a list i think up there uh of two things left i have to do the floorboards and i have to do my closet again but other than that i've already detailed the whole house but i try to get that stuff done in two days because then i have nothing else preventing me from getting my work done yeah so that that's a big thing which i think a lot of people will find busy work to do to not sit down and get the job done. That happens to me a lot yeah. too, man. And and again, it's 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 a topic we talk about a lot. It's it's called being self aware, you know. And and I think that comes with uh, maturity. I'm not saying with age because people mature at different stages in their life. Mm -hmm. But I think with maturity and becoming self aware and knowing that those things are a distraction, but they do have to get done at the same time. Get them done all at once. Get them done. Get them out of the way. And then you know, okay, I gotta sit down. I gotta get this stuff done. Yep. But, and then the 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 girl thing for me, the like, I just I don't go out. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there. I say a lot of people. There's a large acquaintance uh, group that I've known for a long time that don't see me out and about anymore. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they're pretty sure they they know what I'm doing because every single day across five different platforms, they see me posting stuff about my podcast. Absolutely. You know, I had, a, I had a, one of our guests that's going to be on here um, down the line, um, uh, more than an acquaintance. She's, she's a friend. She actually helped me through a, through a tough time a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I asked her if she wanted to be on the show. She's like, well, absolutely. And then sure enough, just yesterday, you know, she hit me up. She's like, hey, we're going to be out at Sunfest uh, it'd be great to see if you want to come out. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Like, thank you so much for thinking of me. Uh, but I gotta be honest, it, I'm just sitting at home working and, and her response is, oh, I love it. Nice. You know, like, but that's, that's where I'm at right now in my life. Like I'm, I'm so, <sighs> this is what I love to do. Yeah, dude. And there's nothing wrong with that, man. Don't be afraid of saying no. Mm -hmm. Like one thing I, I love telling people no, Yeah. you know, like, not no because I'm I want to sit at home and you know fuck off. Yeah, it's no because like I I have something that I want to get done. Mm -hmm. You know something that's gonna get me where I'm gonna be. Especially like the older we get, like we definitely have to like start thinking about 
you know, the later years of our lives and like retiring and, you know, even if that's a thing for us, because I feel like guys like us will <laughs> always be doing something, you know, <laughs> but like, you know, you definitely got to start thinking like that. My my booking agent, Kenny Mondo, like told me that that men like go through this like thing that's the equivalent of like menopause for women. Mm -hmm. around 30 years old a man starts to really like question who they are and like what they're doing with their lives and stuff like that and where they're gonna be when they're 60 and 70 you know mm -hmm. i know i don't want to be like working my ass off like at some bullshit job paying rent and not have like property and stuff like that you know so i think that the stuff that we do now is going to set us up for our 60s and 70s, you know, to where we're comfortable and we're not, like, relying on anybody else to take care of us. Yeah, I have a thought in my head, actually. A couple years back, I worked uh, on this yacht with this captain, uh, Andy Haberly. Shout out, Andy. Uh, and he told me a thing that he was told once before, which made sense to me, is, like, we got to stop worrying about, like, at, at our age, like, we have to have the thought about, okay, what's next? What, what should we do later? We should have fun right now. We should enjoy what we're doing. When you get to about 50, that is when you really got to turn it into high gear mm -hmm. if you haven't already. Exactly. Because then you really only have 10 more years to really figure out how you're going to live for the rest of the time that you're going to be alive. Because you don't want to, theoretically, you don't want to work after 60. You know, you, you would like to start living your life while you're physically able to enjoy it. Still snowboard at 60 yeah. right uh i'd love to still go for a run with my dog at 60 um i keep expressing to the younger viewership that between 20 and 30 you should really grind it out you know i'm sorry to say it but you should grow up a lot quicker get the work done because your body and your mind can bounce back a lot quicker mm -hmm. than like i said i had a couple of drinks a week back and i couldn't do anything the next day like, like four drinks the next day i was fucked um but figure out, figure out what you want to do and loving what it is and not apologizing for it and being able to say no for the right reasons. I think all of this is like just such good information for anybody out there. Um, knowing to say no to people, but knowing how not to get distracted mm -hmm. is so important. Today, my boys just got back from being away at the F1 in Miami. And I'm sitting at the laptop. I'm doing work. I know you're coming down here to do to do uh, the podcast. And uh, they're taking the boat out. And one friend has to be back by 5 o'clock. And I had the small inkling in my head. I was like, oh, I wonder if I could call Russ up and push him back an hour. And then I could go on the boat. And then I'm like, why, though? Like, you've been on the boat. You've been on boats for 15 years. Like, you've seen the beautiful sky. You've been on the water. And your focus, like all this happens in half a second of a thought. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to get my work done. 20 minutes later, you hit me up like, yo, dude, I'm in the neighborhood. I know it's early. Is it all good if I come by? And we just, you know, we put this down now. And I was like, thousand percent, let's get it going. You know, and, and it's, it's having that self-awareness of like, yeah, I've been on the boat and it is fun, but it's going to be more fun when I buy my own boat. Yeah. Because this became so successful and I have more time to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll never, I'll never stop. Like I've said this before. I thought cooking was my passion. I thought that is what I was meant to do the rest of my life. But I realize now that that was what I was meant to do in order to facilitate what I'm now doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm ever going to stop it because I love cooking. Like when I get to cook for my boys, I fucking love it. Oh like, yeah. I see that. This turns off. I don't even think there's no worry. I'm just cooking and it's great. But sitting in the chair and talking to people, I cannot wait. I'm going to enjoy the process getting there because I'm not in a rush. I want to have so many people in that chair. I want to have so many podcasts on file. I love doing this. And I can see myself, no matter how big my company gets, no matter how many new companies I create from this, I will always have a podcast. Because mm. it, it just makes me feel good, dude. Dude, keep yeah. doing it then. Yeah. Because like... If it makes you feel good, do it more. Yeah, exactly. But. Well, on on that, um, I'm not going to lie. This might be the uh, one of the longer sessions of sitting and talking, which is uh, not shocking. We, we just we just vibe so well and we have yeah. a conversation. So um, is there any socials, anything that, uh, you know, we're going to put down below in the description here? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I love new followers, man. I love meeting people and like hearing your stories. If, uh, if you're a creative and you want me to watch your videos or listen to the music you're creating or a mixtape or something like that, definitely shoot me a message, man. And, uh, you can find me at DJ Merkham. That's DJ M U R K E M. Perfect. And we'll have that written in the, in the description down below for everybody as well. Um, I mean, honestly, it's just such it's just such a such a great show, man. I just I love conversing with you. We always have good good topics. Good, like we don't even have topics. We just go right the fuck into it and yeah. we just talk. And and it's literally, I mean, the episode might be less than this because of editing, but we're over two hours now just sitting yeah. here shooting the shit and only stopping because it's already long enough for Tysa to edit right, this, right. right? We could get four or five hours probably. Nah, but, man, but we got a good basis yeah. for people to, like, really, you know, enjoy what we put down, and it just came natural, man. I, so I love it. So I appreciate you having uh, me on, dude, brother. Thank you so much for coming by, and, and there's no doubt, you know, we'll do this again in the future. I want to thank everybody out there for joining us once again here on the Life Choices podcast. Please don't forget to scroll on down, hit subscribe, Hit the bell so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. Uh, check us out on all of our uh, platforms, which are all written down below in the description. Uh, we'd love to see our community build based on exactly what we're doing here, just organic conversations uh, based on mindset and success. So uh, thank you very much for coming out, everyone. And of course, we'll see you here next week on the Life Choices Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, you are now about the journey. Life, 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 life Choices Podcast.